Okay, I'm back. Mind rolling, Raghu. I am here with a, somebody who is so far across the other side of the world of ours, this very crazy world of ours right now. Uh, Tyson Yungaporta and Tyson lives in Australia, Melbourne, right? Uh, yeah, that's where I'm staying right now. Welcome. Great to have you. Yeah, good to see you. So, um, I could go through a whole thing and read off of the thing I got from the publicist around the book. He's written a beautiful book. I mean, very rich. I mean, rich. Called Sand Top: How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. And, uh, but I would rather, if you don't mind, and I know you because mm -hmm. you're probably doing a lot of. Uh, a lot of these kind of things lately, maybe not a podcast, but um, just I'd like to hear your story growing up where you grew up. Uh, in okay. I mean, <laughs> please. Yeah. Hey, look, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really into promotion and all that sort of thing. Good. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it, yeah, don't worry about blurbs and all that kind of stuff. Let's just talk. Sounds good to me. Um, yeah, so I well, I just uh, had a really rough childhood. Um, I don't particularly enjoy <laughs> revisiting all that. I know it's a different thing in the United States. People like to go, you know, and then when I was 12, my uncle did this, and it just it kind of just goes on. And then, like, people write books about it, and then they're, like, an idiot, and they tell it again, and then they're, like, I don't know. Um Yes, I think America uh, likes to re-traumatize itself quite a bit, but um, I'm, I'm not really into that. But yeah, I, I don't know. It was fairly crappy, um, but I grew up all over the place. Um, I was I was actually born here in Melbourne, but moved out. I was moved away when I was a little baby, so I don't remember anything about it. Uh, so I spent most of my time up north and in Queensland, and um, just moved around. I was I was on uh, I was in construction camps most of the time. Uh, I don't know if you know what a construction camp is, but it's when they build infrastructure sort of out on the frontier of things, you know, um, you know, gold mines and dams and um, the stuff that kills the world, like all that kind of thing, um, you know, where they have like hundreds of sort of single men just sort of slowly rotting in caravans and stuff like that. So I, I grew up in those places mostly, um, you know, no shoes and, you know, run around like a little bit feral and all kinds of stuff going on. Mother um, Your mother and father? Um, yeah, I, I uh, sorry, my phone went off here. It's okay. Um, yeah, I, I I lost them. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, just I don't know. It's just it's just a really crappy story. I don't really like going into it. Um, a, I don't know. It, it's I. You probably see my face now. I'm starting to feel a bit no good about it. Um, yeah, I, basically. Yeah, they were from um, they were from different places, and there was um, um, you know different family lines and bloodlines and stuff like that. Um, I ended up uh, uh, reconnecting with one of those, um, and you know was building that relationship uh, when I was a younger man, a younger fella, and. Um, yeah, it ended up that that didn't go very well, you know, really very highly dysfunctional uh, sort of people. And um, so, you know, lots of, you know, heroin use and stuff like that. And it, yeah. it just kind of, yeah, it was all a bit ugly. <laughs> it's not, I mean, like I, I keep, I, people keep looking for this like redemptive story, mm. uh, you know, and everything was bad and now you're this wonderful thing. And, you know, you can do it. Um, like that kind of thing. That's not really uh, my story, you know. 
I'm not a very impressive kind of person or, you know, a, a tale of, 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 you know, <laughs> wonderful things or anything, um, you know, but for uh, more than half my life, um, now I, I've been, uh, I've been from, um, uh, I've been, uh, adopted part of, um, the Arpledge clan, uh, from Western Cape York. Um, it's a, a law thing that we have in Australia, you know, traditional law, um, like adoption is a very, it's a very enduring, all encompassing thing. So I guess there's different kinds of adoption. Like you might be informally adopted just for the amount of time that you're there. If you go and visit a community, just so that you come under the laws of that place. Uh, there's that, but then there's uh, like full customary adoption, which is different. And that's been recognized in um, even the you know, high court in Australia and all that, uh, like a lot of the native title. So the Marbo case, I don't know if you ever heard of that. That's a famous one. Um, and that was based on customary adoption. So people claiming land through, you know, um, adoptive links, uh, because when you have that full adoption, you have to take on those genealogies. So because I lost my family um, as a young fella and um, I didn't have any other family, you know, my, my, and so I was an Aboriginal person that was not really linked very well to, you know, the traditional homelands or traditional um, uh, tribal peoples. You know, I had like a, a troubling relationship um, with some of those and people, you know, um, people were, you know, passing away all the time as well. And it was very volatile. Um, I think the last, the last, uh, cousin and auntie that I had really strong relationship with, uh, uh, from that, uh, old heritage for me, um, they were, yeah, uh, very unwell, very suffering. Yeah. And I don't know. So I kind of had, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, like, uh, so, you know, I watched, my, I've never told anyone this, I watched my cousin die and, um, you know, I'd sit with her in a hospital and nobody else in the family, no one else in the family sort of would even go to a funeral um, or anything like that. It was just all, you know, I think people have a romanticized ideal about, you know, you know, finding family when you've lost family and that there'll be this homecoming and that, you know, some salt of the earth fella will be there wiping off his greasy hands on his overalls and there'll be the big hug and it'll all be like that. It's, it's just not like that. It's pretty shitty actually. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, people are always like, I don't know. I used to tell this story all the time and all the details and names and, and I'd have a little cry and people really liked that because that's what, I don't know, that's what we always do. Um, so in Indigenous Australia, that's pretty much what we write. You know, most of the books, if you get books written by Indigenous Australians, it'll be their freaking life story, their miserable, crappy life story, and how they overcome all their disadvantage to get to finally write a book. And people will go, wow they wrote a book and you know that's where it goes to and then they've got to try and explain why they're not very dark <laughs> because that's another thing especially if it's an international audience because um you know most of us are not dark skinned anymore um here but you know but we still retain our connection to land and we um we retain that assertion that we've never ceded sovereignty uh, because we haven't, these lands have never been, um, uh, ceded. There's never been a treaty or anything like, like you guys have over there, you know? Um, so we just, yeah, we're kind of this unknown, unknowable sort of thing. That's, that's generally only knowable in, in certain little ways through certain little formats. You know, it's like, uh, ah, there's this self narrative genre and that has a structure. And you see that repeated over and over again. And I've been guilty of it. I did that for about a decade. That's pretty much all I did. You know, I'd have to do keynote speeches, you know, 
like I, I, I was in, uh, so, you know, I'm doing cognitive psychology and then I'd, I'd have to do a keynote speech, you know, on cognition, on indigenous cognition. And the first half of it would just be my shitty life story. And everybody going, oh, my God, that's amazing. That's just amazing. Oh, my God, what you've been through, you know, and to come out the other side is so inspiring. And I just, I just don't find it inspiring. So I had a mentor who was an academic, a uh, Torres Strait Islander academic, who said to me, boy, you got to stop doing that. you got to stop doing that. We all have to stop doing that. That's, it's no good, you know. It's just, oh, it's just invasion porn, <laughs> you know. It's colonial porn for people to look at. And it's, it's embarrassing. It's shame. And you have to stop doing it. It gets in the way. He's saying, did you notice that nobody heard what you said in the second half of the keynote? <laughs> what were all the comments about? Your crappy life story. Just, just let it be. And, you know, and I found that when I stopped telling the story and I stopped even thinking about it, then I stopped re-traumatizing myself and I actually got a lot happier and I got more, a lot more productive. I was able to, you know, produce a lot more things for the colony and the whole neoliberal system, which, you know, it means I get more rewards. I get to like, uh, have a phone that works, um, roughly. But not a computer that works, obviously, because I can't make this microphone go. <laughs> but, you know, I think the more I do the positive thinking and and smile, uh, I guess the, the more productive I'll become and the more rewards I'll get. Mm. Who knows, I might write another book yet. Yeah. If you do a book, yeah, that's along those lines, it will it'll work really well here in America. I mean, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, positive that's thinking. Cool. Uh, my favorite book ever from the States, though, was that um, Smile or Die. It was by, what's her name, Barbara Ehrenreich or something. Mm. Yeah, she, she, I, it's, uh, and the subtitle was How Positive Thinking Fooled America and the World. <laughs> and she traces the history of uh, positive thinking. Yeah. And it's really terrifying. <laughs> so anyway, I love that book. The people call me a pessimist, but uh, and you know, are you real glass is half empty kind of person? And I'm like, no, I'm not. I, I just, I just want to know what's in the bloody glass, you know. <laughs> That's it. What's in the glass? <laughs> um, I, it's so at the, uh, I just want to refer to some stuff in the book. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, you have traveled with so many incredible people. That, uh, mm. So many adventures into the, uh, shall we say, the truth in my lexicon. And my experiences all uh, took place in India when I was a young man. And uh, I have been going back and forth to the uh, most of my life. So um, this... This is like a, in a Ram Ram Das kind of way, or in a yeah, exactly. My, he was a teacher and friend, and you know, he okay, months ago. I didn't know that. Oh, you, him specifically. Huh? Yeah, him specifically. Like you I knew met, him. I met him. Oh my goodness, that's that's mad. I I met him in Montreal, where I'm from, Canada. Today. I'll be damned. And yeah. uh, and then followed him back to India when he went back the second time, and met the that being that. Uh, his guru, Ninkaro Baba, the man okay. who it. And from yeah. then, my whole life went, you know, I don't know, it was going sideways pretty well. Yeah. Started having a uh, forward momentum, shall we say. Okay. Mm. Um, so just a little something. The stories that define our thinking today describe an eternal battle between good and evil, springing from an original, originating act of sin. But these terms are just metaphors for something more difficult to explain. A relatively recent demand that simplicity and order be imposed upon the complexity of creation. A demand sprouting from an ancient, ancient seed of narcissism that has flourished due to an imbalance in human societies. Yeah, talk about narcissism. I mean, you know, yeah. I don't know. 
I, I mean, I'm not that familiar with politics in Australia, but I do believe you have something of a Trump kind of brother over there. Is that the, <laughs> the, the, the narcissism? <laughs> They're all Trump brothers over here. <laughs> even the even the liberal ones. Um, yeah. Although we say it back, we say it backwards. Like liberal over here means conservative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because of, you know, liberalism and all that. Mm. Americans are funny. Hey, um, so I don't know. Well, let's start with what's the core? What was the core of the thing that you learned from Ramdas? What the was the core of the thing? The, the uh, thing that transformed you, that first switched you? Like what well, the general area of the core of that yeah. message? Okay. In my own words, and ultimately over time, right, uh, it was about the more that you are focus, it's focusing on the little mini me that you are telling your, st your story about, mm. you are lost. And when you start to realize that and start to move out of that into the interconnectivity and realizing it's the we and it's the servant we that is why we are here on this planet that that encapsulates a very generally a what uh, what happened what has happened over this time now, yeah it's been pleasant um, because that uh, attachment we have to that story is so pernicious and yeah. so i mean it's like a glue like crazy glue that you you know crazy blue mind yeah you can't even start you can't even start an interview with somebody without making sure they have room to tell their crappy little story you see what i'm talking about <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, and and it's just the ultimate narcissism mm. and the idea of a life story we, we've never had that in human history no one ever sit around a campfire and told their life story you know we tell stories about things that have happened. You know, we tell stories about creation. You know, uh, we tell stories that will help us understand things and learn things and connect. But having to listen to like, um, you know, Lucille sitting there, you know, tell, and then when I was nine years old, <laughs> I had to go down to the back. Uh, it's like, ah, uh, nobody wants to hear that. Um, you know, and there's a reason for that. And there's a reason for the boredom that comes with that as well. You know, there's all these mechanisms that are screaming at us. Get your eye off yourself. Get your eye off yourself. You're not very important. Now, I, I think what you went through with Ram Dass would have been some kind of, uh, uh, always, you would have experienced it as a rite of passage. Mm. Oh. Now, always these rites of passage as human beings, and we, we come, it's all the same. Okay, so human beings for most of human history have been living pretty much the same culture and the same pattern all around the world. And so all around the world until very recently, the tiniest blip in time, around the age of 14, 15, you would have experienced that rite of passage. And that rite of passage would have taught you a few things. But the most important thing that it would have taught you is you are not very important. And that's the first blow. Because <laughs> mama's told you you're important. Or your aunties, grandmas, everyone around you growing you up as a baby. It's giving you that, I'm important. <laughs> and then, boom, you get that slap. You're not very important. And it hurts Big slap. and you, you go through pain with it. But then you get realized that you've had those cascading realizations, right? And there is a structure to them. You know, it's like, there's a few comforts in there because, okay, so I'm not very important, but then nobody else is really that important either then individually, you know? So therefore nobody's better than me. I'm not above anyone else, but nobody else is above me either. And so out of that, all of a sudden, your mind starts to extrapolate 
governance systems and ways of being together that are a lot more interdependent, interrelated, and through that you sense the connectedness of all things in that group. And then that spreads out to other entities, animals, rocks, trees, all these things. I am not greater than that tree. I'm not greater than that rock, you know, yeah. but even that mountain over there, he's not greater than me. That's you know? just the inter- You get all this. And, and there, there is a series of cascading realizations, yeah. you know, because you start to, and where you end up with the point that you end up in order to go on to the next, because there are every 15 years, there are new rites of passage to go through in human cultures. So you come to the, you know, when you, you come to the end of that first one, you realize something like, you know, and we don't want to do spoiler alerts for people who haven't done it, but it's kind of, you end up, well, if I'm not important, okay, I'm not important, but I, I belong to something important. You know what I mean? I'm part of something important. You know, and then as you go through your life, you take on different roles, you know, uh, in that important um, thing that you belong to. Yeah. And that thing is, I don't know, you might think of it as a dharma or something like that, yeah. you know, but you have a role and a duty yeah. and you carry it forward through your life. None um, and that happened with change. Me. They change happened. with new knowledge. Like none of this happened with me. Uh, I mean, as you went through that right, as you just talked about, mm. and I did, and I, I was just questioning everything. Like, yeah. what, uh, right? what, what is this I have to conform to, to fit mm. in? And uh, it was only through psychedelics that I suddenly saw cl- more clearly the interconnectivity of everything. The fact so that did you know Timothy Leary as well? I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know Tim. I, you know, I, I knew him more through Ramdas. Although I saw him just on the, you know, in in public, but no, yeah. I don't know him per- personally. Yeah. This is so exciting to meet a contemporary of these people uh, who was around and who was experiencing it. You know, yeah, yeah. I've, um, Quite a, yeah. Um, I've, I've never met anybody who was connected to that circle before oh, really? it's, it's really exciting because i think it's um th- there are ripples that come out from um things like that i, I think there was a basin of attraction around those two men yeah you know? so yeah. In complexity theory terms you know the you have these basins of attraction and i think a lot of things happen around there and there were a lot of ripples that went out into the world and those ripples some were terrible you know, a lot of the creation of the internet came out of those guys <laughs> and what they did. And the, the, you know, a lot of the people who built the internet were, um, were building on those ideas. You know, the very, you know, little windows and hyperlinks and things that we're using right now to talk to each other. You know, these were things that were found through trips, psychedelics. You know, these are ideas. People were trying to recreate a dreaming world that they'd skated around the edges of. Well, Einstein did this without any tripping, right? He did. Yeah. Thought experiments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so listen, uh, just to move a little bit forward, because there's something I, I just read this thing. I went, wow. Did, when did you write this? A couple of years ago or something? Maybe? No, last year. Last year, okay. Yeah. Well before what we're going through right now. And here's you you say, there's a pattern to the universe and everything in it, and there are knowledge systems and traditions that follow this pattern to maintain balance, to keep the temptations of narcissism in check. But Mm -hmm. recent traditions have emerged that break down creation systems like a virus, infecting complex patterns with artificial simplicity exercising a civilizing control over what some see as chaos. Mm. The Marians started it, the Romans perfected it, the Anglosphere inherited, the world is now mired in it. 
The war between good and evil is in reality an imposition of stupidity and simplicity over wisdom and complexity. That's beautiful, man. I love that. Uh, thank you. Pe people, I mean, that's the gotcha moment for a lot of people. I've had that passage read out to me before. Really? In um, radio programs and stuff in Australia here. And they don't read it the same way as you. <laughs> oh. They read it kind of as an accusation, like they're reading back um, oh. <laughs> something in a court case or something. And then you said, you're <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> saying that Western civilization is stupid. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was nice to hear it read in a, a in a positive light. That totally po it's not positive. It's truth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. It is truth. Get, there, there is this order from chaos. Yeah. Or order from chaos. Sorry, I still got the Latin inscription in my head. You know, it's a motto that they have. Right. Yeah. But but I think it's worthwhile talking a little bit about when you talk about complexity. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. You know, we're talking about wisdom and complexity. How do they? Yeah. Connect? And what are you really talking about with complexity? Well, there's there's a difference between the the complex and the complicated. Mm. You know, so a complex system is self-organizing, and it has this kind of homeostasis where it will it will self-correct. You know, so if damage is done to the system, then the system will will heal itself. You know, so uh, you know, I don't know if I. Uh, bump you on the head with this <laughs> not too hard just like i don't know just about like that hard it it's gonna hurt you know it's gonna leave a mark <laughs> um but it'll come good because your body is a complex system so your body will heal itself eventually that lump will go down you know um if there's any blood you know that'll come and heal it and all that sort of thing um, but if I did that to this laptop here, eh, if I got this phone and I hit that the same way, that's not going to fix itself because this is a complicated system, this one, you know, so it requires constant intervention, maintenance, upgrading, you know, tinkering, you got to tinker with it. So one of the big examples I use is the international space station, that space station is a complicated system. And they got to work real hard to stop that thing from just falling apart and crashing back through the atmosphere. But the fungus that's growing inside it is a complex system. There's a fungus currently overtaking the International Space Station. <laughs> yeah. And it's a bi biotic, you know, self-organizing complex system. So they can't kill it because every time they invent a new poison to try and kill it, it comes back stronger. Look like you the know. virus that's going on now. Yeah, the uh, the virus I see is something else. The the virus is not um is not a pathology in and of itself. This COVID nineteen, along with all the other viruses, because lots come out all the time. It's every ten minutes, there's another virus. It just keeps coming, and that's coming from disruption of the landscape. So basically, we've destroyed uh, most of the ecosystems on the planet, or they're in a state of extreme stress, even the best of them. The ones that you go on holidays and take photos and think of as untouched wilderness. Um, these are all highly stressed landscapes. Now, there are animals in those highly stressed landscapes who are under stress and in extreme distress, and who are like refugees. They're fleeing, you know, um, the poisons, the toxins, the destruction, uh, the ecosystems that are falling and in, in, in these cascading effects, and they're having to flee those places. Um, or they're struggling in those places desperately to survive. So those animals are sick. So sick systems, they produce pathogens. Um, and of course, as they're fleeing from those environments, they, they infect other species. Uh, with the pathogens that are being produced through that sickness in the land. So as I, I see this, uh, this disease at the moment as a, it's more of a comorbidity issue rather than a pathogen in and of itself. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very much. I mean, look what's happening environmentally around the yeah. world. It's yeah. Extraordinary. So it's like, I, I have a, a, a friend that uh, we just did a little virtual retreat last weekend. His name is, uh, he's a scientist. His, his name is Bruce Damon. And mm. uh, I, I think you'd enjoy speak. I should introduce you guys at some point because I think you enjoy each other. Uh, but he just said, yeah, this is Gaia. The, in relation to the virus, yeah, a little smack in the head, like you just demonstrated. It's a pop that's going to hurt, but it's going to recover. And hopefully, in that tap, love tap, there will be a, an awakening. We hope we look at it positively. There is some awakening going on. Mm. Uh, I've said I just walk up the street, take my daily walk. And people are walking by nicely distance and we look each other in the eye and and hi. And it's like, hi, here we are. Yeah. We're in this together. We're yep. here. That wasn't happening before. So he, yeah. But this is more of a love this ain't the nineteen eighteen plague, it ain't the bubonic plague, you know. It's not uh, Ebola. But uh, we hope we get it. Um, mm. But as I read through your book, Tyson, there's so much. Uh, this other, the, the fact that we're dealing with this incredible narcissism throughout, not just yeah, the, but people, but us. That uh, is is something that really has to change. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it has to change. And, and look, I mean, terming <clears throat> some of these people is. Yes, we're going to have to deal with these idiots. At one point. They will be dealt with at one point or another. Yeah. But then at the same time, it's, I mean, you can't engineer those changes or dealing, dealing with all these things are things that, these are things that can't be designed by a single mind or a committee. So I talk a lot in the book about that, um, the complex human systems that we need to develop in order for these uh, solutions to emerge and the new tr systems of transition to emerge, you know, these have to be quite organically emerging by groups of people, massive groups of people, you know, behaving like um, all like little nodes do in a complex adaptive system. Uh, there are a lot of people trying to, um, yeah, trying to engineer these things. At the moment, I don't know if you ever came across the Game B community. So no. there's a lot of a lot of tech people, you know, who who came who came out of the Timothy Leary side of things rather than the Ram Dass side of things. You know, um, the people who built the internet basically, um, and then have found that it, it did not fulfill its promise. You know, because they basically tried to tinker that system and to try and recreate. Um, the indigenous dreaming world that they'd encountered on these trips. Um, but they had no framework, no society or culture that was grounded in a landscape and in responses to the land and to the patterns of creation. So they were kind of these tourists. You know, when you see like the tourists in Fiji or whatever, walking around drinking out of coconuts <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we'll take these coconuts back and the umbrellas. And the hibiscus, I'm going to have a lay and, and I'm going to bring this back into my life. I'm going to say aloha every day or whatever, because they've been to Hawaii. It, it's kind of like that. Um, so I don't know if you see the Game B community on, on, on Facebook. They're all really smart people um, who are still, they're trying to tinker these systems. Um, and they're coming out of that. You know, these are all contemporaries of Timothy Leary. That's why I said I was really excited to meet somebody who'd been involved in that because I've been following these people for a while because they have really good theoretical perspectives mm. that are grounded in complexity and they get into a lot of game theory and, you know, co-evolutionary fitness surfaces is about the closest thing in Western science that I can find to what I'm talking about um, in our way. But, but these are still very young very new philosophies, you know, and they're really struggling to try and design it with, they think their mind is here, you yeah, know, that's it. but their mind. So they still have that narcissism 
of like thinking that their individual brain and mind and then you know the things that they can communicate with other people and design together is going to solve the problems mm -hmm. uh, but it won't because they're complex problems and using complicated you know uh, philosophies and, and theoretical tools to solve complex problems is only ever going to be nibbling around the edges, you know? Yeah. When hey, you said, I, I wanted to, before I get away from this, I'm changing yeah. the subject, but um, Gaia, the term Gaia, do you know where it comes from? Greek? Greek? Because uh, um, have you ever uh, read about the Roman wedding ceremony? No. Like so, the Romans had a wedding ceremony where they would call each other because Gaia is the feminine of Gaius. So you know how all the emperors they were all like, you know, Julius Caesar was Gaius. You know what I mean? They all had that name first. A lot of them, you know. <laughs> um, and yeah, and the, the name's still there today in English, Guy and Guy in French and all that sort of thing. Yeah. I think it's Gaetano in Italian. Like it's a you know, right across the Western world, it's still a name. Um, but that's it. So the, the line in the wedding ceremony was, um, you know, uh, I am God. So the woman would say, I am Gaia to your Gaius. And the man would say, I'm Gaius to your Gaia. You know, and then they would get married. And then he would be part of familius and have power of life and death over her. Like, you know, so within their little domus in their house, he could kill her if he want. He could crucify her in the living room, and he was perfectly within his rights. <laughs> so that's who Gaia is, and there is that that um, patriarchal relation to the planet that we just can't escape in the DNA of this language that we're all forced to speak. Everybody, you know, even to the point of when we try and think of the spiritual name for this planet that we're living on, this sacred being. The best we can come up with is, you know, the name of a Roman wife who didn't own property and could be beaten to death by her husband at any moment, <laughs> you know, or just thrown out in the street because he wants a, a younger one. No, I want a 12-year-old wife now. You know, like <laughs> they could just do that. And, and it's kind of... Yeah, it's kind of the way that we treat the earth. And it comes down to this seed of narcissism. And, and that's a story I can tell you. It's a story that you could tell me because every tradition on the planet has this original sin, you know, this narcissistic moment of, of when this, uh, this thought that's the origin of all human suffering started to come to the front of our consciousness. This suspicion that I am greater than i'm better than i'm better than you ah i'm better than him i'm better i'm 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 amazing i'm better than this land i'm better than that tree that tree exists for me you know that woman exists for me now, those are my children <laughs> you know um it, it all human suffering comes from that because uh, and then you know people start killing each other Cain slays Abel and all that sort of thing because they're like no I'm better than you no I'm better than you yeah. so in our way that um one of our stories around that see my totem is Brolga and Brolga and Emu are always fighting in a lot of our dreaming stories so I know all these stories about Emu and in a lot of them at the start of creation um this narcissism enters into the pattern of creation it's a seed it's a seed of evil that emu brings in where emu thinks that he's better than everyone else and shows off tries to show off tries to um trick people tries to harm people in order to show his dominance you know uh, and it just goes like that um yeah it's it's that original sin of narcissism and it's basically I think it's the source of all suffering, all human suffering. Yeah, you know what the Tibetans call it? They have a good word for it. Self-cherishing. Self-cherishing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. yeah. But I want to read a little more because uh, it's not weird to sit here reading this book to you, but 
<laughs> yeah, that's all right. I, I like the way you read it. It's um. Thank you. So we're you know, you're talking about containing the ex excesses excesses of malignant narcissists is a team effort. Love yeah. that on its own, right? When you were yeah. just talking about it. the combination of social fragmentation and lightning fast communication today, however, means we have to deal with these crazy people alone, as individuals butting heads with narcissists in a lawless void. And they are thriving unchecked in this environment. Engaging with them alone is futile. Never wrestle a pig, as the old saying goes. You both end up covered in shit and the pig likes it. <laughs> <laughs> the fundamental rules of human, inter human interaction do not apply to them. Although they weaponize those rules against everyone else. The basic protocols of Aboriginal society, like most societies, include respecting and hearing all points of view in a yarn. Okay, that's number one. It's the mm -hmm. number one thing that we need right now, include respecting and hearing all points of view. In yeah. Narcissists demand this, right? Then refuse to allow other points of view on the grounds that any other opinion somehow infringes their freedom of speech or is offensive they destroy the this is just like yeah, i mean you could just watch trump on i mean we have to sit there and watch this guy on tv you yeah know, like the most, they destroy the basic social contract of reciprocity which allows people to build a reputation of generosity based on sharing to ensure ongoing connectedness and support Shattering this framework of harmony with a few words of nasty gossip. They apply double standards and break down systems of give and take until every member of a social group becomes isolated, lost in a Darwinian struggle for power and dwindling resources, resources that destroy everything. I mean. Then they move on to the next. <laughs> then they move on to the next. And then yeah. The next. But. Yeah, this little parentheses you have here, you know, um, allowing people to build a reputation of generosity based on sharing to ensure ongoing connectedness and support. Is that not step number one for us? Yeah. To share out? And if you ask me about what I got from my whole experience, you know, in the formative years of my life, being with this particular being and hanging out with Ramdas and all of that, you just said it. That's a key thing in turn. I mean, he was all about that. He yeah. caring. He could I mean, he was told, this is, you know, people are going to go, Robbie, you're going to tell that story, yarn again. Are you? Um, but I'm with you right now. And I don't really care. Yeah, yeah. He was told by his guru, do not, when he went back to the West, do not talk about me when you go back. Fully knowing, of course, that's all Ram Dass was going to do. So recently I said to him, why did you do that? You were just talking about it. You came back and you were doing talks. And he said, I couldn't help myself. I couldn't <laughs> help myself. I had this jewel. How could I not share that? And so that spirit is what um, has infected everyone who's come into contact with him over these decades. Is that spirit of generosity and sharing, which you so beautifully uh, spelled out in this little thing you just read? Yeah, yeah. It's um, just I, I get it's um, it's hard to it's hard to resist gurus, and I guess gurus are always trying to resist becoming gurus, <laughs> like if they're just a person of knowledge. I mean, you know. But, like a, it's like we have this, uh, you know, in these civilized societies, there's this imperative, you know, and we're all in it now and we all follow that pattern. Uh, we seek to elevate, like, you know, people always, people don't say, what are you reading? They say, who are you reading? Mm. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Like, uh, it's like the messenger is more important than the message. Mm. It's that branding thing that I said from the start that I really want to resist you know, myself, because, you know, me, I, like, I'm really unimportant. And I guess in, in my communities here, I'm a very marginal person, you know, um, 
in, in the mainstream community and in the Aboriginal community, I'm, um, I'm not a very elevated person. So I don't speak for any of this knowledge or anything. So I don't want to, you know, it, you, you always want to resist that. The people always want to elevate you. And um, I try really, like you can see my guru in this book, hey, eh? it's that old man Juma who provided a lot of the symbols. Yeah. In the same way as you've got that one behind you, reminiscent of a mandala. Yeah. And it's a similar tradition that we have here. Yeah. And that's what the name of the book, Sand Talk, is about that tradition of drawing in the sand. You know, a lot of these things. And a lot of the more ceremonial ones like the Tibetans and um, and like the mandalas that, that you would know, you know, these are always temporary images, you know, in cultures all around the world. Like these are created and a lot of work go into them, but then they're erased immediately afterwards. Mm-hmm. I guess so that they're not cherished, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and yeah. elevated in yeah. the same way as that the people who are doing them are not being cherished and elevated and are resisting that. Yeah, you know, the, um, like, and Juma is really hard not to elevate him, and but I work really hard to make sure that I'm not. But as that's well self-referential. I mean, you are elevating him. He he has no care. He has no self-reference about who he, quote unquote, is or isn't. I mean, yeah. being that I sat in front of, him, it was a one-way street. He wasn't. He wasn't doing anything. Wasn't thinking he needed to do anything. There was nothing like that kind of inter personal stuff going on yeah. whatever i did i was following the story which included the whole hindu tradition and gurus and i'm from the west and i'm making my way over there to get the wisdom yeah. of the universe and save everything you know, whatever the yeah whatever i was doing right but like there, alexander the great just following yeah. that <laughs> yeah there was nothing going on in this particular in this being whatsoever that that resounded with any of that you know yeah at all um but you talk about it here you talk about uh something not that in a particular way but i really love the way uh that you talk about how we separate ourselves either the, somebody's greater somebody's lesser and so yeah. uh, respect must be facilitated by custodians but there is no outsider imposed authority no quote-unquote boss no quote-unquote dominion over it. while senior people ensure that the processes and stages of coming to higher levels of knowledge are maintained with safety and cohesion, there is no centralized control in Aboriginal societies. This mm. is this is a something we can't understand. You know, Western mm. mind coming from these privileged things. We we can't. Uh, yeah. knowledge systems are centralized. And this could be why they have so far been unable to engage in dialogue with indigenous knowledge systems in the development of sustainability solutions. I think this is a key thing in the book. Uh, certainly, mm. maybe just talk about that a little bit. Please. Yeah, I mean, well, I, everybody recognizes now that, that um, you know, centralized authority and centralized control systems uh, are not productive, that they're extremely fragile and they're not adaptive enough to be able to respond to uh, changes disasters etc and anybody who didn't realize that you know a month ago is realizing it now yeah <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. um so you've got i mentioned that game b community before you know it, there's a, there are a lot of thinkers out there and especially silicon valley guys and everything they're obsessed with decentralizing like creating tech for decentralizing these systems yeah block. what they don't Blockchain. What I realize is that the, the the need for these centralized institutions in the first place, it was about issues of trust. So they're not trying to resolve those issues of trust and create human systems and communities that are trusting and transparent. Instead, they're, they're trying to maintain those mistrustful communities and try and impose some tech solution to take that that centralizing control out of human hands. So, yeah, blockchain, as you mentioned, it's there to, you know, all right, well, we need this mechanism in place, you know, to resolve the issues of trust. Mm. Um, you know, what is that? In these, what is yeah, that? in these boxes that, that, that just suck energy and require so much more energy to cool and like, like really now at this, at this moment, 
when we're not teetering on the brink of, you know, global catastrophe caused by this <laughs> burning of energy in the first place, that that's where that's our solution. It's not to find ways to trust each other. It's to find a tech solution to the trust issue. So that's why these centralized things are coming. But um, and, and people know they need to go, but they don't know what to replace it with. But basically, you know, Aboriginal society has had tens of thousands of years where we've basically just focused on the narcissism problem. And we've just focused on, you know, those cascading ideas coming from that, what I told you earlier in that first ritual, that first rite of passage where you realize you're not important. You know, there are governance systems that come out from that realization, you know. And so basically we've spent, you know, ten, tens of thousands of years longer than anyone else on the planet developing governance systems that are decentralized. Well, they're not even decentralized because they weren't centralized in the first place. They're just not centralized systems. These are distributed, you know, models of being, you know, and models of governance. And they do scale. So, uh, you know, a lot of, um, you know, so you keep coming across this idea like the Dunbar number. You've seen this one. Oh, that's that's the same thing that, that's coming out. A lot of, uh, a lot of these theories like uh, systems theory, game theory. Yeah. All that sort of thing. Your game theorists are all the ones who are trying to design these decentralizing models, um, you know, from the tech community. And, you know, they have this idea that you're always going to end up with, um, you know, defectors within a group once it passes the Dunbar number of 150 people. So you can have a transparent society of 150 people. Um, with distributed governance models and decentralized and all that sort of thing. But once it passes that Dunbar number of 150, it doesn't scale beyond that. But, but in Aboriginal Australia, we did scale it. We were able to scale it. Um, so yes, we did live, live in these smaller groups of up to 150. However, we had a lot of interaction, you know, between the groups. We weren't isolated uh, for all of that time. We were more of a, a anarcho-syndicalist kind of thing, you know, uh, and it's the syndicalist that's important. So we, we had a very interdependent economy where we were traveling all over Australia. If you look at an Aboriginal map of Australia, you'll see 500, 500 different territories, small territories, each one with a different language. And you'll see that everywhere. You'll see that still in the Caucasus Mountains, you know, the Caucasian people were named from, you know. Uh, they still have that linguistic diversity there. You can still see it around the world in places that remain undisturbed. You know, there, there is uh, diversity and interdependence and you don't have that expansionism going on. You know, it is scalable. It, it is possible to achieve this kind of interdependence. And um, where does that pattern come from? What's the secret to it? What's the design? It's basically about the big message in the book, which is just being like your place. Mm. You live in a bioregion and you follow the patterns of that bioregion. So that bioregion shapes your language. It shapes your laws, you know, the stories, the creation stories, the creation processes, the patterns of creation in that place will shape the way you live. It'll shape the way you interact with other groups who have different patterns. You know, the, the patterns of the land and the complex biotic systems that you live within, these are the patterns you follow. And I guess as a beginner, if you were starting out, you might, um, you know, you might begin with uh, biomimicry principles as a way to do that. So I see that, that shape behind your head, and I'm reminded of the COVID-19 virus. It's actually, is, us. it's in Be Here Now. Okay. It's it's his thing of the heart cave. Yeah. Well, and well, I think um it's uh, the 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 virus the covid-19 is is basically a ball of a spiky ball. Yeah. Like yeah. that. And um well, you know, and it, it operates by attraction. The the spikes on that ball are attracted to the proteins on cells. Yeah. 
and they stick to them. I, I guess if you were going to learn something from this virus, you might think about, wow, how can I make myself more sticky? <laughs> if I'm this, uh, you know, funky ball of spikes, <laughs> what what surfaces do I want to be attracted to? What surfaces do I need to be attracted to? And then when I connect with those other surfaces, um, in what ways am I going to transform those things I'm connecting with? But more importantly, in what ways am I going to allow those things that I'm connected to to transform me? Absolutely. Yeah, because it's that back and forth, and and we 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 went away from it. And I guess we'll come back to it. That reciprocity mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier that yeah. you mentioned. You know, um, yeah, you have these reciprocal mutual um, interactions where that reciprocal altruism, for example, you know, you do things for each other and for community with no expectation of return. However, at the same time, you're also accruing almost credits, social credits yeah, in doing that. Yeah. And we call that reputation. You know, you, you end up with a reputation for generosity. And these are things that it's like you're, you guys call it 401k, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're building your 401k of, um, of generosity. Yeah. And That's these are things that will ensure you're yeah. also looked That's after. Yeah. 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 Listen, so <clears throat> I can't, you know, we're getting close to the end here, taking the time, uh, but I can't leave it without, I mean, we've talked a lot, you know, we've talked about the, the big ill of narcissism. Yeah. And the other big bill that's a theme in the book that needs to be mentioned is the flawed relationship between civilian men and women is the basic uh -huh. unit of our enslavement in the global economic system that has come to dominate our lives. There is no way men would submit to the labor we undertake without needing to attract them and support our women or worse, without the promise of being able to dominate them by accumulating capital and forcing them into dependence. 90% of the world's wealth is owned by men. Most of the wages in the world go to men, while women do about two thirds of all the work, most of which is underpaid or not paid at all. Sustainability is an impossible dream in this unevenly gendered system. So it is worth revisiting the idea of liberating ourselves. And yeah. Well said, my new friend. <laughs> uh, it's very important. It's it's so easy to sideline these things when you're in this state of emergency, you know? It's like, oh, there's bigger things to worry about right now than feminism. You know, we need to worry about climate change. It's like, well, you know, we need to get things right in the most important. I mean, that's the other thing about Aboriginal society. It's been it's built around that fundamental, the central relationship. In Aboriginal society is that mother-child relationship and the support of women you know in that role um, and in that relation is the center of all things um, you know and it needs to be honored it needs to be respected um, uh, women need to be honored and respected uh, we don't if you don't have that then you know it's not about Gaia anymore it's about Gaius Everything comes back to the Romans, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, the, the Romans to be a Roman citizen was to put up with a hell of a lot of indignity and, you know, impossible expectations of you had to throw your life away in service to the empire. You know, you'd have to go away for decades from your family, all that sort of stuff. And, but you would put up with that with senators having power of life and death over you, emperors, all the rest. You put up with that because the trade-off was you had power of life and death over your woman and her children and your slaves. You know, it's yeah. this, um, that <laughs> it's this false sort of payoff. It's like, well, you get to enjoy this brutal power relationship as well. You can enjoy the benefits of it if you submit to it. And it's us, us humans with penises that have, uh, have made that agreement. Yeah. You know? yeah. And that's all of us, everybody who's been overtaken, you know, we're, we're all refugees from our own homelands and from our own ways of being mm -hmm. on this planet. 
from everything in our DNA that's screaming to live in a certain way. We're, we're refugees from that. We've been displaced, dispossessed, and we're not in our habitat and we're not in our proper way of being. And the men, we've been changed into these monsters, you know, yeah. Yeah. and we are monsters, you know, we've been, we've had this created. Um, <laughs> so feminism is so important. It's probably more important for men than it is for women, you know, and that basically we really need to embrace it and we really need to sort things out. And it's not about losing power. It's about regaining our humanity yeah. and, and, and therefore regaining our, our, our place in the pattern of creation, you know, yeah. as really important custodians of creation. Yeah. Um, we can't do that for as long as this un unequal power relation is um is in place because it doesn't just enslave our women it it it, it enslaves us exactly and that's yeah. that is not realized uh, yeah we're disempowered by our privilege yeah as men and that's got to go yeah boy this is some book tyson i'm so glad to meet you man. yeah really, really. Oh, me too. i'm i'm just thrilled i i, I, I mean I, i've just been you know, I, I've been looking at the ripples, historical ripples coming out from those two men, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ram Dass and Timothy Leary mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the massive impact that that's had on the world. I, I think w once you start tracking that, you know, and as, as an Aboriginal person tracking through history, when you see all of the patterns that that's created and the good and the bad, you see that there was that was a strange attractor and, and a moment in history. And just to meet somebody who was involved with that is um, oh. it's very exciting to me. It makes it very real. But anyhow, I, we can't. <clears throat> uh, we're gonna. We have to close here. But yeah, I have enough. I made enough notes in this book. By the way, here's the book, everybody. I'm gonna be in the show. I got <laughs> not showing because of my background. Yeah, I'm gonna turn off my background. Okay, everybody. Yeah. I don't care. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyhow, what I'm trying to say is I got a lot more I want to talk about. So I'm going to let me forget about book promotion and anything. I want to talk to you again. So hopefully you'll be free at some point. And we'll get you to get the mic thing fixed up. We'll figure that out. It's just that. Yeah. No yeah. problem. So thank you again. Yeah. Tyson and everybody, you'll go to uh, beherenownetwork.com slash mindrolling. You'll see the show notes, which will have the links to get Tyson's book, which I can't more highly recommend. Now. I don't want to go into a whole promo about it, but I love it. Okay. And I think it has ideas in there that are really crucially important for us, all of us. And, and so uh, you'll get linked up in every way, Tyson. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you again, Tyson. And uh, next time, we'll see you back here. Huh? Sounds great. Mm -hmm. All right. Good to meet you, Raga. Thank you.